Warning, the following show features stunts performed either by professionals or under the supervision of professionals. Accordingly, MTV and the producers must insist that no one attempt to recreate or reenact any stunt or activity performed on this show. I'm Johnny Knoxville, and this is casting my five drop into two open blue men. Hello and welcome to Lucky Paper Radio. I am your host, Andy, and I'm here with my co-host, Anthony, the Steve-O of Lucky Paper Radio Maddox. Uh, a raging drug addict that's going to recover and He's get reformed. A He's totally sober. <laughs> He's got the world's greatest back tattoo of his own face. Uh-huh. I was surprised when we were talking about Jackass last night to learn that you are familiar with the Jackass oeuvre. Oh, of course. I mean, it was a big part of the time period where we were, you know, teenagers. Teenage. Yeah, the, the well, target audience. See, you say that, but I feel like there are a lot of things that I would consider part of the zeitgeist in mm-hmm. our teen years that you have either never heard of, never, like you've never played Pokemon, mm-hmm. you've never watched Dragon Ball Z, or so, you like... I mean, I'm a, I was aware of Pokemon, I was aware of Dragon Ball but Z. But you seem to be more knowledgeable about Jackass than you are about Pokemon or Dragon Ball Z. You were citing specific pranks uh-huh. and stunts. Mm-hmm. It's better content. What can I say? <laughs> Jackass it's, is pretty I good. mean, to be clear, better content than Dragon Ball Z is not a high bar to clear. And what about Pokemon then? So, Pokemon is kind of frustrating because it should be like my jam like it should right. be my thing like we have the new pokemon legends arceus came out and you're like a person that plays breath of the wild you play skyrim and you're like mm-hmm. all i want to do is collect the flowers exactly, and herbs yeah. and i'm like well like i loved uh metroid prime because i'm sure you can shoot lasers and fight people and do the morph ball and stuff but i really just love scanning all the different animals and collecting this catalog but the pokemon are just not good creatures <laughs> i don't like them you're just you're just <laughs> not compelled by the art direction of pokemon basically is what it comes down yeah, to yeah, that's pretty much it does yeah. it feel too childish to you I, I don't want to disparage it too much. I mean, or that's label not necessarily it. disparaging. Like, it just doesn't spark joy for me. It doesn't doesn't do anything for me. I would like to see a Bizarro World Pokemon where you were in charge of the art direction, but it was the same I would game mechanics. Overwhelmed and crushed under the weight of that responsibility. <sighs> <laughs> you're not good at imagining fun parallel universes well you're just like that my, parallel universe sounds like i have a lot of anxiety in my fun par- parallel universe i have the steve-o back tattoo except it's carl sagan giving a du- double thumbs up on my back i kind of think you should get that tattoo I, I, hear me out okay no one would ever know you had it because you basically <laughs> never have your shirt off sure uh-huh. i've known you for 15 years the number of times i've seen you with your shirt off is like not that many probably okay. like a few dozen which maybe sounds like a lot, but 15 years. I mean, it's a long time. Once a year. <laughs> <laughs> basically. Basically. So basically, no one would ever know you have it. No one would ever suspect it, obviously, because your personality is not one where you would expect an enormous back tattoo. And that makes it all the better when you do get to spring it on somebody. I'll think about it. You can like be at a bar and someone will be like, you know, I have a giant car so I can back tattoo. And some drunk person will be like, absolutely no chance. And you'll be like... <laughs> Hundred dollars on the table right now. Then cue you pulling your shirt up, showing off the Carl Sagan back tattoo. Also, you never have to look at it if you don't like it. That is true. Yeah, secret benefit of a back tattoo. Like if you had a horrible traumatic head injury, and were in a coma for a while, and while you were in a coma, we against your will gave you a Carl Sagan back tattoo. How long until you realized? Hmm. Is part of the accident also that I my back hurts terribly? It's just like <laughs> oh, let's just yeah, say I'm you just... were out for long enough mm-hmm. for the the tattoo to fully heal. Gave it like you know two three weeks. It's a great question. A fan of Jackass. Not a fan of Dragon Ball Z. Not a fan of Pokemon. I wouldn't. You contain multitudes. Sure. Okay. Look, I think Jackass is great. I have not gone to a theater to see the new one because I'm not really ready to go to movie theater yet, but I'm excited for it to come out on streamers. No spoilers. Don't anybody spoil this for me. <laughs> Don't spoil the collapse I, testicles in a book. I, 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 did, <laughs> I don't want to know hear, how that ends. <laughs> I did accidentally hear something I would describe as a spoiler. So it, it can be spoiled. Okay. No time to talk about Jackass and Pokemon and the various media of the mid-2000s, Anthony, because this is a big episode. It is the second in our three-part Kamigawa Neon Dynasty set review. First, I want to start off by saying that our survey for Kamigawa Neon Dynasty is open. Last episode, we weren't sure if all the cards were going to be spoiled yet, and they were, so that the survey's been open for a couple weeks now. 
Point being, this is your last week to get in responses. So make sure you visit luckypaper.co slash survey slash NEO, or just go to the homepage, click on a banner there to tell us what you're testing in your cube or cubes from this set. And that will inform the third episode in our series, Anthony, which we will do probably in two weeks, I'm guessing, based on the time it will take to turn around that perspective article. That's definitely the one that I'm most excited about because uh, I don't care about my own card evaluations here. It's so much more interesting to hear about what the the whole community is excited about for the new set. You don't care about your own cubes? I, I don't. That's the wrong way to say that. But you know what I mean. I already know what's interesting to me. I want to know what else everybody else is interested in. So our first episode, which came out last week, which you should go back and listen to if you have not, is our mechanics, themes, and archetypes review of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. That's where we really take a look at the set from a game design perspective talk about all of the themes and mechanics in isolation, what their pros and cons might be in terms of play patterns, but we're not evaluating cards and we're not talking about things in any specific context. This episode, we are talking about the cubes and battle boxes that Anthony and I own and the cards we are interested in testing from the set in them. So here we're going to be talking about some power level evaluations, but always in the context of the cube in question. And then at some point next week, maybe the week after will be our community set review. We're going to talk about what y'all like about this set. So make sure you get those surveys in Anthony, I have the Bun Magic Cube to talk about. I have the Degenerate Micro Cube to talk about. And I also did make an update to my Combat Trick Cube, which I might talk about briefly. What do you have on the docket for us today? I might have been a little bit preoccupied lately and haven't been super up to date on actually you know, swapping out cards in my cubes. So my lists are potentially a little bit speculative. But I have a couple cards that I'm really interested in for regular cube that I think are, are going to be really great fits for that environment. Uh, a couple cards I'm super excited about from my Battle Box, which I've been, I've been working on. And I've got a couple things for my Turbo Cube, and I don't know if you want to talk about the Battle of Wits Cube and all these other silly lists, but I've got a couple other things in there. I think it's good to mention the Battle of Wits Cube, especially if you added a card that wasn't just an alt-win condition. Like, if you just added the ones that are all win conditions, that's kind of boring to talk about. It's just like, I but if you see a it. card where it's like, this actually works with other alt-win conditions, or like, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then I want to hear about that. That all interests right. me. All right. Let's start with the Bun Magic Cube, Anthony. I have... A- Nice little selection of cards here, and they're roughly in order of how excited I am for them, though I am saving all of the channel lands for the end. Quick brief overview of the Bun Magic Cube for those that are new listeners or don't know this environment. This is my primary cube. It is a... I've been calling it an Eternal Cube lately, Anthony, because I really hate the the vintage legacy distinctions, because like my cube is technically a vintage cube. I have cards that are banned in legacy, but people say vintage cube. They so often mean like a powered vintage cube with Moxon and stuff. I would say this is a fair environment. I'm trying to make the Bun Magic Cube have to be a very powerful and fast, but ultimately fair environment. And what that means is that I want all the decks competing on the same axis. I don't want somebody doing the Storm thing over here and not caring about their other opponent doing the Reanimator thing and not caring about their other opponent doing the big giant green ramp thing and everybody's just trying to, you know, solitary each other out. So combat really matters. You're always winning through creatures and all of these decks kind of compete on this tempo value axis, which I feel like is one of the core axes of fair magic. Is that a fair way to describe the Bum Magic Cube? Yeah. What do you think of the descriptor Eternal? I, Am I overthinking I definitely, it? Definitely. No, I don't think so because I think that these terms. We did a whole episode about how the terms we use are important, and yeah. I think that the terms Vintage and Legacy Cubes just really creates a very specific impression for a lot of people, and I think that those impressions are not what you're trying to like. It just ends up being a distraction when you're trying to talk about this cube specifically. Yeah, people that have played it have described it as like I think I'm actually trying to capture a lot of the play patterns of a lot of the legacy meta, if you cut out some of the more unfair legacy stuff that maybe doesn't work in Singleton or as play patterns I don't love. But a lot of like the actual way that legacy plays, like Delver decks and you know Grixis decks and those kinds of things are a lot of what I want the games to feel like in this environment. The first up is a card that I think is kind of weird and hard to evaluate. Perhaps the card in this set that is hardest for me to evaluate, and that is Reinforced Ronin. This is one red mana, 4 a 2 2 artifact creature, human samurai. It has taste. It also has at the beginning of your end step, return Reinforced Ronin to its owner's hand. Then it also has channel for one and a red, discard Reinforced Ronin, draw a card. So we basically have a one mana 2-2 two, two with haste that bounces back to your hand. You have to dash it in, essentially. Like the cost of this card, the mana cost is just dashing in every single turn or however many turns you want to. And then it has cycling for, for two mana. I don't really know what to make of this card. And it is interesting enough that I want to try it because I'm not sure how it's going to play out. I think... My tentative evaluation of it in terms of how strong it is, is that not very, it's probably fine in like a pure dedicated aggro deck, but anytime your aggro deck is trying to shift gears at all, like go bigger than your aggro mirror opponent or do anything value oriented, this card becomes really suspect, I think. 
It's definitely a weird card. I feel like this obviously sort of harkens back to Goblin Guide. And I feel like we've seen this a couple times where, you know, Goblin Guide is such a an awesome design. It, it's a powerful card. It has a meaningful drawback that's really flavorful. Yeah. And they've kind of been trying to recreate that success with things like Wayward Guide Beast and Reinforced Ronin. And I'm not sure that these hit quite as well for me. It's also very funny to see, you know, some people have described Channel as being like, well, it's kind of like cycling. You get to do this thing. You just don't draw a card, but you get that ability. And then this one, they've they've given it cycling as right. a channel ability. So it's it's kind of a funny little package and I don't really know what to make of it. It's definitely weird because if this card were printed in like a master set or something like that, it would certainly just have cycling. But channel is the theme right, of the right. set, so they gave it channel, but the channel is just cycling, which is kind of kind of odd. There's a couple little edges here I, I like. One edge is that I have been paying special attention to all the type lines of my cards since I added Dragon's Rage Channeler and Unholy Heat with Modern Horizons 2, two cards that I've really enjoyed and care about Delirium. So seeing an artifact creature, two types on a card that you can cycle is somewhat appealing to me. I just don't know if it's going to hang. We'll see. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it because I, honestly, it is just really difficult for me to evaluate what it's going to be like to play with it. I, I have enjoyed dashing things in in the past. A Zergo Bell Striker is a card that if, my, if it's my only one drop on turn one, I play it just hard cast it, right? Play my 2-2 on turn one, start attacking. Any other point in the game where I can't afford to dash it in, I'm always doing that because dashing it in protects you from sorcery speed removal, protects you from other kinds of sorcery speed interaction, like planeswalker activations, stuff like that. It's a, a good ability if you have the extra mana to put into it. This forcing you to do that or playing a pretty expensive cycling cost. I mean, two is not pretty expensive in the grand scheme of things, but in I, the context of the kind of decks that want a exactly. one mana, two, two haste. Yeah, I mean, I really like cycling for all the reasons I like modal effects, but aggro decks are the places where I want to be cycling least. And that's because in aggro decks, your cards are kind of closer to fungible, right? Like pretty much all of your cards should say, deal your opponent some damage or maybe remove a blocker. But like you have a very linear game plan. And so just cashing in a card for another card has a lot less value than it does in say a control deck where it's like, I'm going to dig for my board wipe or I don't need this counter spell anymore because of whatever situation I'm in. So I'm going to cycle it instead. Or there's more conditional cards in, in those kinds of decks, which is why cycling is, I think, stronger. So I don't have much else to say about it other than uh, the type lines are interesting and I don't know how to evaluate it. And so I want to play some games with it and see what happens. But I rate it pretty low on my survey. I think I gave it a one. I'm pretty skeptical this will be in my cube in six months. When in doubt, give it a try. Get some data. Is there any value in this context to the fact that this just potentially lets you cast a lot more spells over the course of the game because you yeah. can play this every turn? Yeah, I mean, quite possibly. Uh, there are certainly types of decks that care about just casting a lot of spells. So that could definitely come up. The next card is a, a somewhat similar card. It's also an artifact creature. It is also a one drop. It also has haste. And this is Rabbit Battery. The difference here is that instead of being a 2-2, two, two, it is a 1-1, one, one, which is quite a bit worse. But it is a equipment rabbit. So it does have <laughs> reconfigure. What a great type line. It, it, is, it is quite good. Uh, so this is, you know, it's a Raging Goblin, a one mana, one one with haste that you can just play that way. Or you can reconfigure for red, just red, one mana to give the equipped creature plus one, plus one and haste. This one I'm much more excited about and I think has a much greater chance of sticking around in my cube. It Again, it is this nice space I like where it plays just fine in the aggro deck. I'll play this on turn one. I'll start attacking. I'll be reasonably happy. But it has very real late game value. You know, when you have a little bit of extra mana laying around, you can give all of your creatures you play plus one, plus one and haste for the turn they enter the battlefield. That's a big deal uh, in, in a lot of situations. So I think this card is probably quite good. I also like that it's just another... You know, this to me is like almost like the fairy guide mother of red in that it is an aggro one drop that is not the most raw power level on turn one. But in exchange, you get this modality that you can make use of in the late game, which I think is, is very worth it in the environment I'm trying to cultivate. I'm happy to make that trade off a lot of the time. Something that I've seen again and again that, that just surprises me is how much one power matters on a lot of board states really in a lot of environments. So just the ability to say, well, I've got a 3-3 three, three, and now I can pump that up to a 4-4 four, four and really reshape the way that this combat step is going to go. I, I think that's going to come up all the time and is pretty appealing. Yeah, and, and we talked about it a bunch of times before, but I also really like how putting that power and toughness on any creature can oftentimes mean different things. I'm excited to put this on a Dreadhorde Arcanist. I'm excited to put this on a Flyer. I'm excited to put this on other things to give that 1-1 one, that one, one power toughness additional utility than just right. pure aggressive stats. This next card I should like more. But I gotta be honest, it doesn't really spark joy, but everything on paper, you know, it, it fits all of my goals, and so I gotta try it out. And that's Twin Shot Sniper. This is another red artifact creature. I swear, these are in roughly an order that I'm excited about them. This is not in order of color. And uh, this is three in a red for a 2-3 with reach. 
When it enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to any target. And then it has channel for one and a red, discard, twin shot sniper. It deals two damage to any target. People are comparing this to things like Flame Tongue Kavu, things like Bone Crusher Giant, other things that are creatures with damage based enter the battlefield abilities and stuff like that. I think this card is much more comparable to a card I very recently added to my cube that I was excited to play with. And I think this is probably just better for every reason that I would care about in my own cube. And that's Pyrite Spellbomb. I just put Pyrite Spellbomb in my cube as a slightly overcosted shock. I mean, I say slightly, it's twice as expensive as a shock. So a massively overcosted shock. But two damage to any target is very valuable in my low curving environment. And again, we've talked about the Delirium thing. I'm excited about those type line options where I can put an artifact in my graveyard, in my red deck, recur it with Luris, all those kinds of fun things. Twin Shot Sniper is very similar in that it's going to allow me to deal two damage to something for two mana and put an artifact in my graveyard, an artifact creature no less, which is two types if I don't already have a creature in there. And then it has this late game value of I can just play it as a 2-3 with reach that enters the battlefield and does two damage to any target, which I think is quite good. I say it doesn't spark joy because I don't look at this card and immediately think of a specific deck in my environment that I'm like really happy to play this in. I think it's going to be fine in a lot of decks and that flexibility is nice but I, I don't ever picture myself seeing this card and being like "Ooh, i did it i'm getting there doesn't spark that joy in me i wonder if part of what makes it a little bit less appealing to you is just that really it is just a burn spell like you're going to be casting I, I imagine in your specific environment the, the channel effect almost all the time and it's going to feel like a fail case when you get to well, do the like quote unquote normal mode of the card i'm not sure honestly i i, I could see it being a more even split than maybe you're expecting mm. i mean certainly like against aggro a two three with reach that kills a thing, a small creature on ETB is like a really great way to stabilize a True. board. If I'm playing against an aggro deck, I will do everything I can to cast it normally and not have to channel it out. But of course, having the option, if I'm stuck on mana or whatever, I'm going to die is, is, is a great option to have. I like the card mechanically, the way that it's like all costed and laid out. Just It doesn't it doesn't spark joy in me. I'm not excited to take it in a pack. I'm not excited to jam it in a deck. And dude, that's a big part of the way I decide what cards I put in my cube or what cards I'm excited by. And so I'm also going to test this one. And I'm not skeptical of it in terms of play patterns or power level i'm just skeptical of it in terms of like how much i want to play with it like it yeah how do you uh factor in if at all the fact that it is difficult to counter that effect i don't factor it in much here i factored in a lot more for other cards but in this case two damage it's not like the kind of thing that you're very often going to be holding up a counter spell for sure yeah. i mean it will matter right like the deck that plays a Monastery Mentor and then wants to protect it. I mean, I guess you still could... No, you can't even cast your Counterspell unless there's a thing on the, on the stack. And there's nothing on the stack. So yeah, like if someone kills your Monastery Mentor with it when you intentionally played it on turn 5 to hold up Counter Magic, it's going to feel pretty bad. I hope that doesn't come up that often, I guess. That would be a good reason so to get if, me if, off. if it. anything, it's a negative for you. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't like that tiny little edge that's mm -hmm. only going to matter in certain matchups. Like, you're never taking the card because of that. Right. You're not like, oh, yeah, I need some uncounterable burn here to give me an edge in the control matchup. It's just a thing that you're going to get sometimes that had no strategic weight in your draft picks, and we've talked about that being a thing that I don't like in the past. Fair enough. Next card, Anthony, is the first non-red card. Uh, it is another artifact <laughs> creature equipment. So I, I like these cards quite a bit. This is Blade of the Oni. It is one in a black for an artifact creature equipment demon. It is a 3-1 with menace, and it has reconfigure for two black black. And the reconfigure ability is one of the only ones in the set that doesn't just grant the creature's base stats. Instead, it turns the equipped creature into a demon with base power and toughness 5-5, five, five, and it gives it menace. The flavor of this is so good. It is really, really flavorful. Uh, this card does spark joy. Uh, this is a card where I'm kind of maybe a little skeptical of the play patterns, but the actual card itself is really exciting to me, and I am excited to try it and see what happens in it. So this reads on its face, obviously, I think, like an aggressive black card. And we've talked before about black aggro on this podcast, and you know, I think that where I've come around to it now with my current environment is that, like, I would not consider my cube to support, like, mono black aggro. I don't think that deck, if you only take black cards, is particularly effective in my environment. But I do think aggressive decks with black cards in them, whether they're white black or red black or three color, can be really effective. And I think this will work quite well there. It is worth noting, this is, like, a weird card with no downsides. Like, so often these black aggressive creatures... It one or two mana have some downside. They can't block. They enter the battlefield tapped. Like something that makes them less good on defense. I mean, or, I yeah, not. I expect to, to say like uh, when you drop the demon sword, you die or something. Right, you know? right. And this one has no downside. So we just got a 3-1 with Menace, which is a pretty good type line. It's going to push damage through. Three power on a Menace creature for two mana is 
a very potent combination of stats, I think, and that it's very often going to force either unfavorable trades where maybe I have a creature I'm willing to trade, like some dumb token with your demon, but I have a creature I want to protect. And I have to double block it, so now you can kill the good thing. Yeah, a 3-1 Menace is just like an awesome package to me in terms of the way that it interacts in combat. Right. Or it's just going to, you know, force double blocks, and then you're going to eat both their creatures, which is great. If you can trade two mana for two of their creatures in almost any situation, you're very happy. So, And then the reconfigure ability, obviously, is huge late game value. Turning something into a base 5-5 with Menace is pretty nuts. I'm immediately thinking of putting this on a Blood Sky Berserker, which is just a one moment with all those counters. You make it a base 5-5, and... Just go ham. Or you could just put this on a, a Stone Quill Serpent. That's even better. So, yeah, I, the the modifying the base power and toughness is also a cool way to do it, too. Like, I like that it's a different approach to adding power and toughness. I mean, say adding. It would always add. It will always add my cube, pretty much. Unless, you, yeah, I guess you're... You probably wouldn't reconfigure this onto your Primeval Titan. You could if you wanted to, I guess. Give it Menace. I think it's going to be plenty effective in those two-color aggro decks to be worth a slot. And uh, like I said, the card is just... It's fun. I like it. Very cool card. This next one has generated a ton of buzz on Cube Twitter and Cube Discords across the internet. It is the only card from Neon Dynasty Commander that I am considering, and it is Swift Reconfiguration. One white mana for an enchantment aura. It has flash. It can enchant a creature or a vehicle. The enchanted permanent is a vehicle artifact with crew five and loses all other card types. What a wild card. It's pretty wild basically you know for one mana at instant speed you put a pacifism-esque effect on a opposing creature or vehicle and it's i say pacifism it can't attack or block unless they crew five which is a really steep crew cost in an environment like mine some other cubes that might be achievable really hard for me to imagine very many situations where that is achievable in my environment and you wouldn't just be attacking with the five power of things that you could otherwise attack with right because i don't have very many singular large creatures so if you've got five power, you're just going to attack with that, probably not reanimate whatever little creature or medium-sized creature has swift reconfiguration on it. I will admit my first reaction to this card was, that's a complicated way to give me what is basically an instant speed one-man pacifism. And I oftentimes don't like when cards are like needlessly complex. We've talked about this additive distraction before. It's got all this text on it. A new player is going to be like, what does this even do? Like, <laughs> why is this so complicated? When in reality, it's going to play out a lot of the time, like a one mana pacifism. But that's also part of the fun of it, isn't it? Like you have this card, it doesn't just say destroy target creature. It says do this wild thing and sort of the reveal of exploring what does that actually mean and how relevant is that downside is, is kind of the fun of exploring magic. It says come up with a pun for how you can turn this card name into a vehicle somehow and uh, and do that. Well, the thing it really, I think, has brought me around on it, and I'm still not like over the moon about this card. I know some people are like thrilled about this card, think it's like a new staple of their white removal package. I'm still not over the moon about it, but I I am brought around a little bit by, you can protect your own creatures with this. And at first I was like, yeah, but that's never going to come up. And then I thought about it more and I'm like, actually, that could come up quite a bit. What you can do is protect creatures that have relevant static abilities, activated abilities, triggered abilities that you just don't want to have eat creature removal. Because creature removal is the most common counter removal in my environment. It just basically becomes an artifact vehicle. And unless they have a way to remove an artifact or you decide to crew it, it's now safe from all that various creature removal. Specifically, I'm imagining sticking this on a Monastery Mentor, right? Like, you go to sure. a Monastery Mentor, I respond by turning it into a Caristeri Mentor. Turn no, it into we, a Turbo Teen. We can do better than that. Monorail Mentor. There you go, Monorail Mentor. <laughs> Turn it into a Monorail Mentor. Get my trigger, right? Because it's a non-creature spell. In that case, I'm happy to trade the Swift Reconfiguration one for one with a removal spell and in exchange, have my creature modified in a way that I think is probably kind of net neutral. Like, oftentimes you do want to also attack with your prowess 2-2, but here, it gets a little more resilient. You lose the body, but the more I've thought about it, the more I think maybe that mode is actually real, and not just a 0.05% of the time you do it, but put it on Young Pyromancer, put it on Monastery Mentor, put it on something that has very relevant abilities, might actually be kind of interesting, and so that's what brought me a little higher on it. It's a weird card. I'm really curious to see how this is going to play out. I don't think it's that hard to evaluate. I think it's going to be a one mana pacifism and instant speed. Sure. A million percent of the time, basically. But we'll see what my tolerance is if it actually plays like that. And I'll be more excited about it if it ends up actually having edge cases that matter. And I don't really think there are going to be that many edge cases that matter. But if they come up, I'll be pretty happy about it. Next up is the Lion Sash. It is one and a white for an artifact creature equipment cat. It is a 1-1. One, one. It has an activated ability. Pay a white mana, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a permanent card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Lion Sash. And then it also has reconfigure for two, and it gives the equipped creature plus one, plus one for each plus one, plus one counter on Lion Sash. 
This is, I think, justifiably drawing comparisons to Scavenging Ooze. It also costs two mana. It also can eat things out of graveyards for a one mana activated ability. It also grows larger over the course of the game. And what it trades off, I mean, the first big trade we should mention is that it's in a different color. And I think oftentimes color shifting in effect dramatically changes how effective and useful that is to you. I do think in many cubes, a white Scavenging Ooze would be a lot more powerful than a green Scavenging Ooze because I've noticed that a lot of cubes don't often run a density of like attack your opponent threats at two mana in green, whereas a lot of cubes do do that in white. And this is effectively that kind of card. So I think that is the first thing it's worth noting. I think if you just print a white Scavenging Ooze, it will probably be better than Scavenging Ooze in a lot of environments because of that color shift alone. This does have serious trade-offs. The main downside is that it has half the power and toughness. You know, some people are like, oh, only one less power and toughness, but it's half. I mean, the difference between the floor being a bear and the floor being a two mana one one is a pretty substantial difference. In exchange, you get the upside of getting service into an equipment on a creature, which is very real upside, and only for two mana, which I think is pretty relevant. Yeah, there, I mean, that seems huge and very important to the white section of a lot of cubes, where I think compared to green, you see a lot of, you know, flying and double strike and first right. strike and then keywords that really adding a little bit more power onto uh, is going to be really, really relevant. Yeah. There's a small difference is you don't get the life gain. Uh, you get the counter, whether you exile a permanent, not just a creature. So there's other small differences, which actually are kind of annoying to me, given that both yeah. will be in my cube. It's like, which one is this again? Does it care about creatures or just permanents? Does it gain life or not? I think it's going to cause a little bit of confusion because so many people see this and immediately map it to scavenging news. And it does have differences that, that, that matter. I think in a cube with a lot of fetch lands, so that's actually a pretty meaningful distinction because For sure. scavenging news might not actually be able to grow until fairly late into the game. Especially, frankly, a lot of green decks don't remove creatures, so right. it's going to be your own creatures that died, if anything, most of the time, unless you're, you know, a Jun deck or something. I think this card is great. I'm excited about it. I actually would say that I think the community's perceptions of power level, I think, are a tiny bit high. This is always going to be, you know... Two mana for a 1-1, one, one, three mana for a 2-2, two, two, four mana for a 3-3. Three, three. Like, it's always going to be a pretty behind rate in terms of how big it is, which is not true of Scavenging Ooze. And that upside is going to matter. Like, there are going to be times where reconfiguring it is really powerful. Uh, but it's a it's a late game thing, right? This is not a very aggressive white two drop. It's pretty unaggressive, actually. It's pretty anemic in terms of its baseline body. But similar to how I'm happy to try Rabbit Battery and other cards that don't have the best baseline stats but exchange that for some late game value. This is definitely my kind of card through and through. I got two more cards, Anthony, then the five lands, which I will save for the end. So not that many cards added to the Bud Magic Cube overall. I got to say, I think reading our retrospective article that Parker wrote, uh, and you wrote as well, you, you and Parker worked on together for the 2021 standard uh, cycle of cards, really made me think harder about not being too overly optimistic about cards in spoiler season. I mean, it's fun to test cards and stuff, but I think my ratings have always trended a little high and I have to recognize that like not only am I saying will this card stay in my cube just looking at the passive magic but remember there's going to be right, four yeah. more sets coming out this year and like is this card really going to stick around in the face of new stuff it's like when you're drafting if you see a great red card late in a pack you're not just gambling on has red been open but all the the red cards you're going to get in the next pack as well right same concept yeah, sure yeah it's kind of like that I don't see why not <laughs> Nevertheless, the next card is a card I am very excited about, and that is the Wandering Emperor. This is the white Planeswalker from the set. Two white white for a legendary Planeswalker. It has a starting loyalty of three, and it has flash, Anthony, which is... Well, that doesn't make sense. You can't activate Planeswalker abilities on your opponent's turn. It also says, as long as the Wandering Emperor entered the battlefield this turn, you may activate her loyalty abilities at any time you can play an instant. Huh, I guess they thought about it. They did They're think so about smart. that. They're so smart. The three loyalty abilities are plus one... To put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one target creature, it gains first strike until end of turn. Minus one to create a 2-2 two, two white samurai creature token with vigilance. And minus two to exile target tapped creature and you gain two life. I'm very high on this card in every way. I think it's very powerful. I really like the play patterns. I'm excited to get stupid Gideon Ally of Zendikar's dumb face out of my cube. <laughs> I don't know why. I've never liked Gideon as a character. I hit all of his cards just... He's like the classic, like, noble hero archetype, which just doesn't inspire anything in me. Mm -hmm. I just You want complicated, mysterious heroes. I, I guess. I don't know. I did, I, I've never liked the card, and it's, like, just kind of raw stats, and to me, it doesn't actually offer that many interesting decisions. Like, you mostly just zero and churn out knight tokens, but maybe sometimes you emblem. I don't know. It's I know like, I don't have to remind you. You can just not play the card. You well, don't need a, a more powerful one-for-one -one alternative. I, I, I'm aware of this. I, I'm very well aware of this, and I've actually considered cutting it before. Actually held off on adding it for a very long time because I didn't like it so much. And then I was like, maybe I should try it out for a while because frankly, for a while there, we didn't really have that many Planeswalkers that I would consider at like the three and four mana slots to be just as good 
in like aggro mid range and control as they were in any one of those individual archetypes. Like Elspeth Knight Errant is a card I really like. It's pretty much an aggro planeswalker. Like I'm not very happy in my control deck to just like spit out a one one every turn. That's like an incredibly slow clock. It gets beaten by a lot of other value engines. So like I'll play it in a pinch, but like I'm not thrilled about it. Yeah, you want to be playing it when you are excited about both the modes of making your soldiers and also pumping and jumping stuff. Yeah. And Watering Emperor joins the other Elspeth, Elspeth Sun's Nemesis, which is my other favorite white planeswalker, as just a planeswalker whose play patterns I think I'm really going to enjoy. So here's what I like about this. I love Flash on the planeswalker because it's going to make it so much better in control decks immediately. Because so often you have this tension in a control deck of like, is this the right window where I should tap out to resolve my planeswalker or should I hold up counter magic? And even if you don't, get them in combat with this or do any like, you know, tricky stuff with loyalty abilities. Just the fact that you can play this Planeswalker on your opponent's end step if they don't cast something you need to counter is a huge boon for any kind of controlling deck. So I really like that for any, I was just any kind of reactive deck. I think control has more associations with it. Any deck that's like trying to play reactive spells, removal spells, counter spells as a primary main strategy. So that's a huge boon to that already. I also love that you are basically all of the time, except under very, very rare circumstances, guaranteed to get two activations out of his Planeswalker. Yeah, I think that's a huge thing to be aware of when you're considering the huge, power level of this, huge. that it just it doesn't get attacked the first time. And the combination that all of these abilities can either be relevant, you know, if you're just saying, well, it's the end, I'll wait till the end step, cast this, make a, make a guy. Or, you know, cast it after the declare attacker step and pump one of your creatures and, and actually turn combat to your side. So, and, and while you're doing that, it's still not being attacked. So I think that that's pretty potent. Yeah, I think it's really potent. And I also really like that, to me, all three loyalty abilities seem very well balanced. Again, if you look at Gideon Ali of Zendikar, I think many, many, many times you were just supposed to zero to make a 2-2, because that's just the best thing to do. It stands out to me in a vacuum as the most powerful, appealing loyalty ability, which means that in a lot of games, it plays out pretty repetitively. It's like, I got my little 2-2 engine that just turns out 2-2s. Maybe I do something else. Maybe. Here, all three of these modes seem very well costed for the loyalty cost and very relevant. Like, I'm going to flash it in and make a 2-2 to trade with your attacker. I'm going to flash it in to exile your attacker that is a little bit too big for me to trade with a 2-2. I'm going to flash it in and put a plus one plus one counter on something as a combat trick. This is a, this is a combat trick, Anthony, which I know you oh, love. Wow. And I'm excited to have combat trick flexibility without combat trick narrowness of being dead in my hand if a combat trick is not good. I think it's great. I think it's going to end up playing more powerful than many people are expecting. I've seen people say like, oh, yeah, it's cute. But if we're talking about like the most powerful four mana white planeswalkers, it's not in the conversation. And it's all very context dependent, certainly. But I think it's going to be more powerful than people think. And I'm very excited to play it with my cube. It's got great art. It's just a, it's a slam dunk on all layers for me. Yeah, I think that the what you're saying about the the modality is really important to me. I'm not the biggest fan of Planeswalkers as a type, and really a lot of that is just that they can be very repetitive. It's just, you know, I'm going to play this, and I'm going to make a token every turn, and that's what it's what's happening. So the fact that we have a, a Planeswalker like Elspeth Sun's Nemesis as well, love it. where the modes are all relevant and it's going to play out differently depending on the context is much more appealing. Yeah, and I can't overstate how powerful I think it is that you get two guaranteed activations out of right. this card. The floor on this card is like four mana, make two two twos with vigilance and have a planeswalker left over that your opponent has to deal with, either by attacking or like dealing a damage to. That's like the worst this card can be, which is not true of even a card like Gideon. The worst Gideon can be is you play it for four mana, you make a single two two, then it dies, right? It gets hit by the removal spell, your opponent has enough attackers. Like that card is sometimes worse. The floor on this is crazy high. If you get to four mana, this card is going to do relevant stuff for you pretty much no matter what your deck is, no matter what the board state is. It's a very potent card. My last non-channel land card is Eater of Virtue. This is our new fancy bone splitter, Anthony. I did not expect to get a bone splitter side grade in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, but here we are. It is one mana for a legendary artifact equipment. The equipped creature gets plus two plus O, oh, but whenever the equipped creature dies, you do exile it. And then as long as a card exile with Eater of Virtue has flying, the equipped creature has flying. The same is also true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Protection, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance, and it has equipped one just like Bone Splitter. So we have the same baseline relevant stats of one mana to cast, one mana to equip for plus two power which is a time-tested and proven powerful card in a lot of contexts because Bone Splitter has has demonstrated that. The Bone Splitter was like one of the first 
equipments we ever had, right? And so they were still kind of narrowing in the balance. Yeah, I think, I, 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 memory serves, I think it was a common, and that was a huge mistake in Retail Limited because you just took it over everything because it was so much better than everything else you could be doing. Here, we have what I would describe as a side grade. Exile in the Creature When It Dies is very real. Again, context dependent. In my Bun Magic Cube, that matters. There's a lot of graveyard matter stuff. There's a lot of reasons you want resources in your graveyard. So exiling stuff when it dies is a significant downside. I just think the upside is so freaking cool that you get these creatures exile with the sword and they like their their spirit is embodied in the blade. And now when a creature picks it up, it gains these static abilities to make it better in combat. I do have another quibble with this card, which is that this is another just side effect of the complexity of magic over time. Is it, it that you hate the list of keywords? It, You'd rather it just say has a keyword well yeah but it doesn't it doesn't have every keyword listed on it right you're gonna have some things i haven't actually checked the button magic cube to see if i have an odd keyword that is not listed here but like it doesn't gain every keyword you have to check the list is this one on the list i mind this more when the list seems complete but actually has a conspicuous missing element and you have to remember which one's missing like what is the uh the two mana card you really like that has vigilance uh and gains other keyword abilities of other cards but one of the ones it doesn't gain is death touch because it's a white creature so it can't have death touch thunderous orator that's the one like, that one bothers me because it's like, oh, it feels like it gains everything, but you have to read the whole list. Actually, Death Touch is not on this list. This feels pretty comprehensive to me. I don't think it's going to come up much, but I'm excited about this card. There's not much else to say about it. I, I, it. It's a high floor, and it has this really cool story potential where, unlike Bone Splitter, it's going to do really different things in certain games, like have these weird edge cases where it becomes much more relevant because of the way the game is played out in a very cool way, I think, that is exciting. I can't decide which is a better flavor win between Blade of the Oni and Eater of Virtue. For me, it's Eater of Virtue. The name Eater of Virtue is the coolest name on an Very equipment we've had in so long. It's so cool. What I really love so much, like the, the cards that really strike me as the most well-designed or most appealing are the ones where the mechanic actually carries the flavor. Like, does that make sense? It's not, yeah. When I say flavor, it's not just about, oh, it's got a cool picture and a cool name. A cool flavor text. It actually, the, the structure of the card Absolutely. tells the story of, like you're saying, you grab, pick up this blade and if you're defeated, your power, your essence gets absorbed into the blade and now everyone else who picks it up gets that. I just love that like, you're going to just put the creature card under the blade, right? Because it's exiled. Right. Like, it doesn't matter where that card is. You that's just a put really it nice there thing, and then yeah. you have this like stack of creatures building up under the Eater of Virtue. You play your rabbit battery late. You equip the haste creature with the Eater of Virtue. Now it's a big monster. I think it's very cool. I'm very excited about it. Cool card. All right, let's finish up the Bun Magic Cube editions with the channel lands. There is one in every color, and I think any of them are considerations in the Bun Magic Cube on power level. The order in which I like them. So I like the red and blue ones least. The red one just because... I just, frankly, I'm not that inspired by a land that makes spirit tokens. Like, it's a red land that makes color of spirit tokens, which I get is flavorful for this set. But that, to me, feels more like, uh, you know, just kind of a random... It's hard to describe why I like some of these and don't like other ones, because everything I would say criticizing why a card feels wrong to me, you could lobby that same criticism against the ones that I like. But I'm just going to lay it out there. I don't like the red and blue ones that much. The white, green, and black ones I really like. My favorite by far is Igonjo's Seed of the Empire. This is the white one, so it legendary land, comes into play untapped, taps for a white, so quite good. In singleton environments, it is essentially a just upgrade over a planes. Can't fetch it with stuff, but, you know, pretty close. And it has channel for two and a white, discard Igonjo, Seed of the Empire. It deals four damage, target attacking or blocking creature. They all have this ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature you control. Flavor for cubes, I, guess. I really wish that wasn't there. Like yeah, I kind of do too. It's going to actually matter. There are especially the white ones. Lots of legendary creatures that are around because of you know reasons, but it's just not interesting to me. It just feels like yeah, they're just they just it's wanted flavor, to add a yeah. little bit of a nod to this sort of legendary theme because that's a big part of the flavor of the set of of the plane. But for most cubes, it's kind of just eh, why do we need more words on this card? Yeah. So the white is my favorite one. Green and blue, green and black are close behind. The green one is one and a green to discard it to destroy target artifact, enchantment, or non-basic land an opponent controls. They may then search their library for a land card with a basic land type and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. This one's generating a lot of hype in eternal constructed formats, could potentially be quite powerful. I think it's very nice to have a main deckable, what is essentially a naturalized. Like in my environment, sometimes you will destroy a non-basic land. I do have guys, cradles and stuff running around and field of the dead. It will happen. And so I'm glad to be able to like fit a kind of sideboard effect onto a card that is just 100% main deckable. You know, it's just a, a green land. And I'm excited to see how my players rate that card, right? Because I think it's very much up for discussion. How good is this effect, which 
I don't have an artifact theme. I don't have a lot of enchantments running around. So like many games, this is just not going to matter. You're just going to play it as a land. But the cost of inclusion is so low. So the question becomes, where does that fall in the draft when you're actually looking at it? Because if you have it in your pool, you're right, going to play always it playing all the time. Green. Every single time. The question is just where you take it in the draft. The black one I am excited about. And this brings up the point I wanted to talk about about these lands. I feel like at my power level where I often cannot afford tapped lands, for a long time, there was kind of a dearth of utility lands I felt like I could run responsibly on the same power level because I felt like a lot of the tapped lands were just huge liabilities and so they weren't worth the cost of inclusion in a lot of decks. Now, with this cycle, with the mythic modal double face lands from Zendikar Rising, with the castle cycle, we have tons of very potent lands that I'm no longer just going to play all of them because... I love this like flexible ability to have spell effects attached to lands, and I love what they do to the draft where they make people take lands highly. I can be selective about it, and I think I'm going to end up cutting Agadim's Awakening, which is a card I do really like, for Takanuma Abandoned Mire. This is the black one. Its channel ability is three and a black, discard Takanuma Abandoned Mire, mill three cards, then return a creature or planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. Not that far off from Agadim's Awakening in terms of what it does. What I really like about it, though, is that Agadim's Awakening is kind of just a card for aggro decks. You're not going to play Agadim's Awakening in your control deck because you're not going to have one and two and three mana cost creatures for the most part in your control deck that are worth recurring with Agadim's Awakening. And there, the life loss from that land out in the battlefield on tap might actually matter. Takanuma is very similar in that aggro deck because the mana you would have dumped into Agadim's Awakening to put it into play, you can now just use to cast the cheap thing. So it's going to cost the same amount, I think, overall in terms of mana investment. I know it only gets one creature back, but I think it's overall pretty similar. But I'm also going to just jam this in my control deck. I can't wait to buy back my Merc Time region with this thing, mill some more cards for it to delve away. I think it's going to be really potent. So I'm most excited about the Abzan lands in this cycle. And most importantly for me now at 360, running a lot of utility lands, I think we have just enough of them now that you get to be very selective about the effects you want for your specific environment, even if you're avoiding tap lands like I so often do. Yeah, I think what's really important to sort of point out about the difference in the power level and the flexibility and the impactfulness of these cards is that especially the green and the black one are really pretty narrow effects that you just often wouldn't right. wouldn't want to have in your deck at all. So giving you a, a way to get these more narrow effects into your deck at very low cost is very impactful versus, you know, making some token creatures like sure, you're already going to have cards that do that. It's not really, it's not filling as big of a gap, potentially. So yeah, I really like them. I like the modality. I'm excited to see how my players rate them in the draft. How much is it worth having this ability essentially for free in your pool? What What is that worth in the draft? And we're going to find out. That's it for the Bud Magic Cube. So I'm, I'm most excited about some of these white cards. There's a couple red cards that are interesting to me. we got the Sword of the Oni, and we got a couple lands. And that's really what I'm most excited about from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. <laughs> Should we talk about some cards for regular cube? We should, but first, Anthony, what is the regular cube for those who may not know? So this is my primary cube. In contrast to your Bun Magic cube, it is much lower power. It's a little bit more like a master set, or I think you could compare it uh, pretty reasonably to a peasant environment, where there are some rares, but for the most part, there aren't like snowballing things and uh, a lot of things that interact with multiple targets at once. I think in terms of raw power level it's probably pretty close to peasant but i think the play patterns do differ somewhat significantly because you do have more complicated effects than with its printed uncommon true, frankly true. so so there's a bunch of things that i'm sort of curious about like i said i'm not 100 percent sure on my list yet but i want to talk with you about a couple of these options the first two like you i'm really interested in some of these reconfigure cards in yeah. particular the red ones i do like and have a little bit of a power matters theme in a couple cards in the in the cube and We've seen this problem. It's it's challenging to get a lot of equipment and other, you know, combat tricks and things that put counters on things because if you have too many of those, you just don't have enough. They just they don't work at critical. Or from a cube designer perspective, you could say it's difficult to get my players to play those cards if I put them in the cube. That's what I'm trying to say. Because I put them in there and then they say I will take another creature instead because I am afraid of being caught in some situation where this card is not working. A handful of combat tricks and all my creatures are dead. Right. So I'm really excited about both Rabbit Battery and Simeon's Sling. So you already talked about Rabbit Battery. Simeon Sling is similar. It's a one mana, one, one. Uh, reconfigure for two. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one. Whenever equipped creature becomes blocked, it deals one damage to defending player. I think that both of these are actually going to be pretty powerful just because 
they're you know cheap things like we talked about adding that one power to your creatures is going to be very meaningful in this particular very combat focused yeah. cube and it's going to just let you put more of these kinds of effects into your into your decks yeah i i think the note on plus one plus one to power and toughness mattering is extra pronounced here combat matters in both of our cubes you're winning all of your games through combat in both situations the difference which is very meaningful here is that games are longer in the regular cube right. so if you do have an advantage that allows for an attack that you wouldn't otherwise allow for sometimes that's worth three or four turns worth of attacks which can turn the whole tide of a game where in my environment oftentimes the board state is really rapidly changing and the game is decided much more quickly and so while that does come up sometimes still it's probably not going to be overall as impactful as it is in the regular cube the speed of the format is also relevant because i do think as we've talked about in previous update episodes where i'm okay powering things up a little bit right now is in the more proactive strategies because yeah. In a slower environment, in a lower powered environment, it's easy for things to trend towards people just sort of playing soupy decks with lots of colors. So having a fastest deck that kind of sets the baseline of, of what you have to like build your deck to be able to play against is a really key part of the environment. One of the things I think will be viable here, which I wouldn't expect to happen that much in my cube, is like reconfigure onto a creature, attack them, reconfigure on a different creature to make your my opponent's attacks no totally, good yeah. and pass the turn. And like that's your turn basically, it's just moving this equipment around to maintain board supremacy whether you're attacking or blocking totally sticking with the theme of artifacts so i also have a little bit of a light artifact theme there's a lot of there's a lot of just like flexible cards that are artifacts so having just a lot of them are colorless <laughs> and, and they're easy to play um and so having just a couple payoffs in the cube like Psy master thopterist to reward you and slightly alter your deck building traxos is in there too is a lot of fun so i'm really excited about mnemonic sphere as a draw spell that can be prioritized if you're doing a little bit of that artifact matters. Uh, so Mnemonic Sphere is one and a blue for an artifact. Pay one and a blue, sacrifice Mnemonic Sphere, draw two cards, and it also has channel to discard it to draw a card. So you can just cycle it for a blue, which is a nice, you know, it just makes the card so much easier to include in your deck. And it's a four mana draw two that you can split across multiple turns. This, I think, has drawn very appropriate comparisons to Hieroglyphic Illumination. And I'm glad this card exists now because to me, it's like, Hieroglyphic Illumination with some of the like, you know, costs and benefits tweaked, but with this huge Artifact Matters payoff, which will matter in a lot of cubes. Art a lot of people make like making Artifact Matters cubes. It's a very popular theme. And so if Artifacts is a theme in your cube at all, having an effect like this, which is very easy to put in your deck, because like you said, you can always just channel it. You can always just turn it into a cheap cantrip. will let you really benefit the most from those Artifact Matters synergies when it comes up. When you do have those things that care and play, this card really shines, but it, it never suffers from not having those build, those build arounds because you can just channel it away. Right. It's also pretty cool that you can, with both mode, get the draw at instant speed. So if you have a Iron Crag Pyromancer and you need to draw two to trigger it, things like that, it, yeah. it gives you a lot of options. Yeah, I think this card is very cool, and I, I hope it becomes very useful fodder for cube designers of all types because it fills a really neat, a really cool role, I think, for, for a lot of different design goals. Yeah, absolutely. How do you feel about ninjas? I know we talked about them a little bit last week. We did. I, I still uh, feel similarly to what I said last week about ninjas. I like the mechanic a lot, and I think it almost has evergreen potential. We did hear from some listeners. I think I had some good points we didn't bring up around the ninjutsu ability potentially being a little bit snowballing because it is effectively a way to get a thing into play for a little bit cheaper at the cost of bouncing a future back to your hand. But in an environment that's really designed to make ninjutsu good, you oftentimes have things you want to be bouncing back to your hand. So you turn that downside to an upside. You have a really, really cheap evasive threat, so you can ninjutsu super early. And I do see that argument that it's a potentially snowballing mechanic. What I would say is that I think it's probably really hard to design tempo forward mechanics that are not snowballing. Because the nature of a like tempo-focused card, where you're exchanging value for some tempo in the game, and in this case, you're exchanging a creature in play for a little more damage to your opponent, a little bigger creature right now, any mechanic designed to allow you to like manipulate that axis, I think is going to have the risk of being a little bit snowball-y, and that's just part of playing tempo cards, I think. So all of that is exactly the reason why I'm actually really excited about Moon Circuit Hacker. So this is a ninja, one and a blue for a 2-1, so reasonable floor. Uh, it has ninjutsu for just a blue. When Moon Circuit Hacker deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card unless Moon Circuit Hacker entered the battlefield this turn. So it's a little bit clunky to read. I don't love that. Another thing I really try and prioritize in this environment is having cards that read cleanly but have the potential for a lot of uh, interesting interactions between the cards. Right. But as far as what this does, the first time it hits, you draw a card. After that, you get to loot. Yep. And I think that's kind of perfect. Like It, it allows you to 
get real meaningful value out of it, but not snowball in the same way. But at the same time, it still is relevant later in the game by turning into a, a Luteriel core, effectively. Yeah, and later in the game, the one mana ninjutsu is really relevant, I think, right. just for if you're intentionally trying to just abuse those end of the battlefield abilities, like having that be really cheap. So you play a three or four drop with a good end of the battlefield ability, the next turn you attack, you play an extra land, you bounce it back to your hand with ninjutsu, and you recast that card again immediately. I think the, the costing on this card in that environment, in your environment specifically, is going to make that line also very relevant so it's either an early way to like draw a card and like get a little bit ahead or a late way to become like a, a dare i say a white man lion-esque little value <laughs> play so i think this is really what i've always wanted ninja of the deep hours to be because ninja of the deep hours you can get into those situations where you know if, if you just don't have a blocker and your opponent gets ahead and they start generating a bunch of card advantage it can really lead to these lopsided games this being cheaper and more efficient in a lot of ways, but not having that high ceiling and snowballing potential, I think it's just going to play out so much better. I wonder if the the snowballing feeling of the mechanic is largely because it is so often tied to when you do damage to your opponent triggers. Right. Which is, I think, inherently much more snowballing than the ninjutsu itself of just return a thing to your hand to get another totally, thing to play. Totally. The, like, oh, you damaged your opponent, here's a benefit. Like, that has snowballing written all over it because, like, you just damaged your opponent. So something's going well for you. Now we're going to give you another benefit for that. I wonder if that's maybe even more of where that sense of ninjutsu being snowballing comes from. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think that, yeah, ninjutsu as a mechanic of just being able to bounce things, that's not snowballing at all. It's it's the fact that that mechanic also pairs really well with combat damage abilities. Yeah, for so sure. They, they tend to design cards in that direction. All right, the next card that I'm interested in, which I, I know a lot of people are for a lot of different contexts, is Touch the Spear Realm. Uh, so this is basically an Oblivion Ring, but it can only hit artifacts and creatures but it also has channel you can discard touch the spirit realm exile target artifact or creature and return to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step i wish i had sealed in an envelope the cards i thought you may be considering for uh -huh. the regular cube because was I, this, so far was i would i would be scoring pretty <laughs> highly on the cards that uh, that i think you you know what i think that means i think that that just means i have clear design goals you've articulated your goals very well which i think is, is a testament to you as a cube designer i love an oblivion ring I love a bounce spell, or a blink spell, rather. Uh, you definitely love a blink spell. People don't love blink spells, but maybe... This is the best kind of a, one. If we put I'm a blink so spell on an ability printed. that you actually do want, maybe sometimes you'll blink something. Yeah, this, this to me, like, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about my feeling about these cards before and the density of them in some of your environments, but this to me is like the perfect card because it does give you that upside of, like, you get two modes, and, you know, it is substantially worse than an Oblivion Ring. Though, I should be said, not in the regular cube as much where you don't have very many Planeswalkers running around. And the ones you do have are intentionally right. not, like, must-answer threats. Yeah, They're I think that context is really important that it is not as big of a deal to lose that uh, ability there. Yeah, so I think this card's going to be potent, and uh, I really like this O-Ring or Cloud Shift. I guess people probably call it Ephemerate now as the, as the ability. It's probably the most notable card that has that on it. So I'm also a little bit interested in some of these other ninjas, uh, specifically Dokuchi Silencer and Nizumi Prowler. I think I'm going to try these out, but my question is really uh, about what we were talking about last week, about what is the density of ninjas that's actually fun? Like, is it most fun when there's just like one or two? And so every once in a while, a ninja comes up in a game and it's like an exciting moment. And if you have a, a high density, does it just become this like, well, I, I can't really not block. And so I kind of have to block or you just sort of lose a lot of flexibility and like control maybe. So I don't know where that dial is, but I definitely want to throw in a couple more, see how that feels, and then it's easier to, you know, correct when you have data points on both sides, right? I, I love that old uh, old idiom of, like, if your first mortar lands short, your next mortar better land long, because then you have more data about how to exactly tune it in. So, yeah, go a little deep on it and see if it ends up actually being a problem for the play patterns you're trying to create. Right. And Nizumi Prowler is especially interesting to me because I feel like it is pushing sort of the the ninja mechanic in a really interesting or just an, an extreme way. So it's uh, it has ninjutsu for one and a black. It's a 3-1. When it enters the battlefield, target creature you control gains death touch and lifelink until end of turn, which is interesting because it kind of means whatever your opponent does, they kind of can't win. If, if you just throw in your two 1-1s one and your opponent has a 3-3, three, three, normally it, there'd be some tension there of, well, maybe you're just attacking because you want your ninja ability and I can safely just block one of those 1-1s one and right. sure you get your ninja, but I at least get some value or you were forced to sacrifice some value to get that ninja ability. In this case, you get to give the other 1-1 one, one death touch. So your opponent kind of just had no chance to, to beat that anyway. It's kind of funny. Like, that ability does not read to me like a ninjutsu ability. That's a thing I always associate with, like, a very defensive ability, right? Like, giving something death touch is, like, a thing you do when you're just turning your blocker into a kill spell. 
here it does play very differently i think it it just reads kind of funny to me that's i think the extreme case where i'm wondering if that's just a play pattern that people are going to find frustrating but again i, I want to give it a try like I, I guess a better way to describe why it feels weird to me is i read it and i was like how can i need to do this on my own turn and obviously you can't but my first thought was like well how could i like when i see give something death touch on etb i'm like well obviously i want to do that when i'm blocking and here you don't you do it when you're attacking i don't know maybe you cast a scout's warning maybe you cast a scout's warning there and you, you just go flash this in and block something who knows it's possible so that's what I've got for the regular cube. Not a huge a list, list, but a couple things I'm pretty excited about. We've talked about this before that you oftentimes have a shorter list because, you know, I'm playing close to the limits of power level. If a really powerful card comes out in a new set, I'm going to be looking at it and figuring out, like, are there play patterns I don't like here? And oftentimes there are. Like, my, my list is definitely not a just, you know, list of the most powerful cards in this set. There's a lot of cards I just avoided because I don't like their play patterns. But if the if it's a powerful card and it has appealing play patterns, I will almost certainly consider it for the Bun Magic Cube. You are operating at a lower power level which means that if you look at this set probably what a third of the cards could be like viable on power level in the regular cube like could totally hang in a deck and so that gives you a much broader choice but that also means you've had that same broad choice for every set that's come prior magic's history which means in a lot of ways your cube is more selective in terms of the actual gameplay patterns you want to create so it's less likely that a new card is going to line up in that in that just right way and tick all those boxes for you Right. I'm not, you know, my exercise is not let's let's do a bunch of research and figure out what are the most powerful cards, what are the most effective cards from this every single new set. If you're trying to do that, testing a bunch of cards makes sense. I'm over here just like, well, I already have so much choice. There's so many horrible cards that I can choose to put in this cube. They're not horrible. Don't call them horrible. I'm not going to let you do that. So many, be- all cards are beautiful. Uh, various time twist is horrible. I don't like that card. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Okay. So yeah, I'm just picking the things that really spark joy for me the most. And if I'm, again, like specific about my design goals, the kinds of cards that are resonant in that way where they are very simple, easy to read, they have meaningful effects on combat, and they have this like lots of potential to interact with other cards. Like that isn't going to be a ton of cards in each set. When I'm looking at a new set for this cube, I'll very often just start with the whole set and then on Scryfall and start adding terms to exclude chunks of cards. So it's like, yeah. okay, well, there's this artifact and enchantment theme that actually isn't appropriate here. Let's get rid of those. This set actually didn't have a ton of mechanics that were easy to exclude like that. But but yeah, I mean, you can just cut out a bunch of chunks of cards and it ends up being a third of the set that's actually relevant. We're going to speed run now, I think, through some other cube environments that have maybe more specific limitations or more specific contexts that make deciding on cards a little easier. I'm going to start with the Degenerate Micro Cube. This is a cube I curate that is a small cube that you draft very small decks. Your deck size is only 15 cards. That's not enough cards, Andy. Oh, it is by my rules. Uh, and the only other rules modification is you do not die from drawing from an empty library. And then within this limitation, this cube aims to explore Magic's most degenerate, unfair, absolutely cruel <laughs> play patterns and combo decks. So it's a very, very powerful, very punishing environment. And there are three cards I'm looking at from this set. The first one is not a card we've mentioned yet. It is Containment Construct. This is two mana for an artifact creature construct. It is a 2-1, and it says whenever you discard a card, you may exile that card from your graveyard. If you do, you may play that card this turn. I'll be honest, I flagged this here just because I'm curious to see if somebody manages to break this in weird ways in Legacy or Vintage. I think it might do stuff with Lion's Eye Diamond, which is in this environment. I'm trying to imagine exactly when I'm happy to, like, discard my hand, turn my Lion's Eye Diamond into a Black Lotus and get to play my hand again this turn. It might come up sometimes. And also, just artifact creatures are better than normal in this set because they do also support Beatrice Workshop. And so being able to play this and another one mana artifact on turn one could be quite potent. I'm going to have to have this proven to me, but I definitely like noted it when I was looking at the spoiler. I was like, this card could get there in this in this cube. This card really captures your attention. And the first time I read it, I was also like, that's an interesting ability. Yeah, I mean... The fact that it's like, ignore all discard until end of turn. Like, anytime you would discard a card, just don't until the end of the turn. Definitely has potential built around power. So I'm curious to see what happens there, and it might end up having a place in the different micro cube. The other two cards are cards we have talked about. They are cards I'm trying out in the Bun Magic cube. The first is Boseju, who endures. This is the green land that channels to destroy stuff. Here, that's extremely relevant. The channeling, if this card wasn't even a land and was just an uncounterable two mana disenchant that also hit non basic lands, that would maybe be a consideration for the Degenerate Microcube. The fact that it is also a land really puts it over the top. I'll be honest, this one might be. I, I, I avoid saying cards are too good for the Degenerate Microcube because it's a weird concept for them to be too good. It's just a matter of like, I don't think putting this card in the cube would mean that the Besaju player always wins, right? It's not too good in the sense that it's going to 
affect win percentage. But it might be the fact that this ability is so difficult to counter and interact with is just very frustrating and stifle specific decks. So if I'm playing a combo deck that relies on my specific artifact combo piece, and I have a bunch of counter magic and hand hate to protect it, and I can't interact with your Boseju, that might be very tilting and lead to unfun play patterns. So if this ends up not staying in the DMC, it will almost certainly not be because it's not good enough, but because it is, in fact, a little bit too frustrating to have this relatively non-interactive removal spell. What an annoying treat. Andy here, editing the show. Just wanted to pop in and say that I forgot to point out when recording that one of the big features of Poseidon in the Degenerate Microcube is that the channel ability is not taxed by all of the various taxing elements in that cube. It's not taxed by Thalia, it's not taxed by Trinosphere, it's not taxed by Sphere of Resistance, it's not taxed by Thorn of Amethyst, it's not even stopped by Nullstone Gargoyle. In this environment where there's a lot of interaction like that, that channel ability being so resilient is a really, really big upside, so... We will see. The last one is the Lion Sash. This is a slam dunk in the Degenerate Micro Cube. Really? Oh, absolutely. Scavenging is a staple of that cube. It's so powerful. Huh, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of graveyard recursion because of the tiny decks. Yeah, because of a tiny deck size, so many decks rely on recurring their entire graveyard into their library and basically reshuffling either their best cards or you know their entire deck. And so Grave Hate is not critical to every matchup, but... Any deck that's aiming to go long pretty much needs to have Grave Hate, so you can basically counteract your opponent's late-game value engines. And this is not only late-game Grave Hate, but it's also in the better color. Like, the Jet Micro Cube, there is a White Hate Bears deck that is quite fair. This slots right into that deck. You can vial it in. I mean, you can vial it in Scavenging Ooze, too, but you can pay for part of its cost with a Bleacher's Workshop. It's uh, it's just a, a slam dunk here because of all the reasons that Scavenging Ooze is good and even in, in, in an even better color. This is like a perfect environment for it, so... I need two Lion Sashes, Anthony, because they're going to go in both environments and be pretty playable in both, I think. May you open them in your pre-release. Fingers crossed. That's it for the DMC. Frankly, three cards is a lot. Most sets have nothing for the DMC. Sometimes there is a card. The fact that there are three here is notable. And it should be mentioned that I think the blue channel land is not completely out of the question because bouncing is very good. I didn't even mention that like the channel abilities also can't be stopped except by things that can stop activated abilities, of which there are some in the DMC. We're going to see how it plays out. Let's stay in this degenerate zone uh, and talk about some similar cards in my Turbo Cube. Woo! We love the Turbo Cube. This is a very simple, straightforward uh, cube. Lots of good cards. It uh, has a one slight small rules modification that all spells and activated abilities cost two generic mana less. It's not small, people. It's a big rules modification. Don't let him trick you. So, uh, since we already mentioned Containment Construct... This is a card I'm really excited about here. Yeah. Uh, so there's a ton of cards. Uh, you might r recall that cycling is an activated ability. And there are a ton of cards with cycling in this cube that you basically just get to cycle for free. Uh, so just being able to say you can cycle all these and then still cast them is extremely exciting and cool. It's very exciting, too, because I feel like at least I personally play a lot of the cycling cards with no expectation to ever cast. Them. Right. I'm like, this is only free cycling, which makes my deck if I have 10 of them, which is not out of the question. I'm playing a 30-card deck, right? I can really trim down on lands. I get all these extra triggers and stuff. Here, making those cards also just free to cycle and cast might actually make me cast them, which it opens up a whole lot of potential play lines. That sounds a little bit too busted, even for the Turbo Cube, but I think it's actually going to play out pretty nah, well. Fine. Looking fine. through the list, a lot of the cards with cycling, there are a lot of cards with cycling, so I've had the luxury of just picking ones that do have like some theoretical possibility of being cast. Mm -hmm. And we have seen a lot of them get cast. I've, I've even had a step through beat me before what that means is if you're you know cycling some just like big creature you might not be able to cast it anyway even if you're discarding it so right some of the more potent things you can do are with the the crystals from ikoria basically turning those into prophetic prisms which is another card that's in the environment it's one of the strongest cards in the environment but having a card which just turns a small number of other cards into the best card in the environment isn't busted it's just pretty cool and good i think yeah i'm excited about it i think it's going to be a good fit Another solid fit that I'm excited about is the reality chip. So this one might not sound quite as turbo, but in this cube, I already do have Future Sight, which is, I think, this single card that actually costs three effective mana. Almost everything else costs zero or one or two, or, you know, has some other alternate cost that makes it makes it free. But the reality chip being an equipment that costs just one blue in this environment and then just one blue to equip and then gives you the Future Sight ability 
just seems like actually makes Future Sight, which is an appealing but not super strong card here, actually impactful. And it really feels on flavor with the the turbo nature of this environment. Yeah, and here, especially the being able to look at the top card of your library and see, like, is it worth my blue mana right now because I'm going to sure, get to go yeah. off or I'm going to get to go a little bit deeper is very relevant, I think. Does blue need to be better in this environment? Not really, but... I would, play I would the not say the Turbo again. Cube is aiming for like a perfect balance of color viability. No. And that's definitely okay. not. We also always, with every set, get, you know, some dinky little Guild Globe type artifact. And at some point, I'm going to have to stop putting them in because False. I just can't fit in this many <laughs> cards. But we do get Ecologist Terrarium, which is two mana, read zero mana. When it enters the battlefield, you get a basic land and you can sacrifice it to put a counter on a creature. So it's, again, you're just going to play this as a basic land in your deck and you get some other little abilities. And that's a great little package. Uh, comparing this to a Guild Globe it's is not quite extremely Globe. No, generous. Guild like Globes a... are broken. This to me is like <laughs> filler almost in the Turbo Cube. It's more like an environmental sciences, but yes. the artifact type is more relevant. Yes. Yeah. I think this is fine, but this is definitely not like I'm not, I will never pass a Guild Globe, but this I'll pass. Oh, of course. I'll Guild, pass Guild Globe is like the best card in the format, which is a fun thing to think about. <laughs> it's fun to make a cube where Guild Globe is un- unpassable. All right. Here's another weird one that's kind of an auto include Reckoner Bankbuster. It's uh, two yeah. mana for a 4-4 four, four vehicle, and importantly, it has two mana, remove a charge counter. It starts with three and draw a card, and so it's just this sort of like Maze Mind Tome or Sunset Pyramid. These kinds of cards that actually generate, even if it's a little bit slow, but generate card advantage are really, really potent in this environment. So I think And to it's be clear, it's not that more. slow in this environment, but it is, you know, slower than other things that give you the cards immediately. Right. I mean, critically, it does just like cycle when you play it, and right. then every other subsequent turn, you draw some more cards. And then this card has more text. It's a vehicle. Maybe you'll crew it someday, and that could be fun. I think you'll crew it in this environment. It eventually just spits out a token for you and lets you, you know, do stuff. So I think it's relevant. So it's really exciting to talk about how busted cards are when you make them too cheaper. And we could go really deep on all kinds of cards, but I think those are really the highlights for this environment. No patchwork automaton. So patchwork automaton has ward, right? Yeah. You That's just don't like war because it's like not ward. actually uh, well, the, ability, so it doesn't get cheaper. The way I've yeah structured the rules is that it only affects activated abilities, which is important. So things like mana leak and other counter spells like still function, which are right. an important part of the environment. So I'm happy with the rules the way they are. Ward is a little bit confusing. There are so many cards I have the luxury to be picky. So if that card was an absolute slam dunk, like it was just the perfect card. It is not the most unique, right? It's, right. it's probably a little bit worse than Mana Gorge or Hydra, but it has the benefit of being colorless, which is kind of a nice plus that you can play it in any deck. But yeah, it's not like... Uh, paving any new exciting ground for the turbo cube right like i I think the one exception is to my trying to avoid those kinds of confusing effects is drake haven but that is a really unique card that you can sort of try and build your whole deck drake haven is adding something special that this would not be so that's the turbo cube i have one more cube that i updated for this set and uh, we don't talk about it much in the show but it is a combat trick mini cube (laughs) I like small cubes. This one is bigger than the micro cube, but smaller than my regular cube. Mm-hmm. To be clear, I don't name the size of the cube based on how many cards the actual cube is. I name it based on the deck size. So the micro cube is the micro because the decks are micro. In the combat trick mini cube, I've set the deck size to 24. And this is just a history of me playing with different draft sizes and deck sizes to try and really strike a balance of being able to build more synergistic decks than you can in 40 card singleton, where you can't build around a specific effect because that effect doesn't exist at that density in singleton environments. And if it's only one of your 40 cards, you just can't really effectively build around it. And so this is a cube built entirely around combat tricks. My attempt to make myself really fall in love with combat tricks. Did it work? I like this cube a lot, actually. We've played it online a couple times and uh, I do really enjoy it. It will be a little while before I build it in paper just because it's uh, it's work. But very different cards are powerful than in other environments, right? Because uh, here there's a lot of cheap creatures, a lot of combat tricks. I've intentionally kept a very different kind of removal suite to be appropriate for the combat tricks that are in the environment. And all the decks end up playing out pretty synergistically. Uh, you have some kind of power matters or creature matters. I think I've talked before in the show about how this also kind of led naturally to a hardened scale style plus one plus one counter deck and to a modular artifact matters deck. And so there's a couple of weird themes that are overlapping here. There's some great cards for this particular cube. I think Blade of the Oni and Rabbit Battery and Eater of Virtue, which we've talked about, are all good and very reasonable inclusions here additional cards i'm excited about are lizard blades this is one in a red for an artifact creature equipment lizard another reconfigure card 
It is a one one with double strike and it gives the equipped creature double strike and it has reconfigure for two. Double strike is great with combat tricks, it turns out. And you know what else is good with combat tricks is combat damage triggers, which are also have a fair number of, of in this cube. And this is to me, I think one of the lowest risk of inclusion, lowest cost of inclusion, double strike abilities we have ever seen. Absolutely. In terms yeah. of actually putting it in a cube. And that's very exciting. Like when we talk about cube more broadly, that's the kind of broad observations I like to make about cube. We're like, if you want to put double strike in your cube, it's been either you have to commit to like specific creatures and then like you can't move it double strike around. But like if you want to double strike on an equipment or an aura, your options were like battle mastery or the equipment, what's it called? Stuff that was really expensive. And so like you would play a bunch of mana and a car that doesn't have a creature attached to it. Then you have to like equip it to things. It was just a lot of, you were jumping through a lot of hoops to get this benefit that could get blown out pretty easily. Blizzard Blades has a fine floor. I mean, a two-minute well mode double strike is fine. Being able to give that double strike to something else in this environment is very exciting. So I'm excited about that card. I'm also pretty excited about Hinata Dawn Crowned. This is not from the commander set, but this card has commander written all over it. It's one blue, red, white for a legendary creature, Kirin Spirit. So four mana. It's a four, four with flying and trample. Spells you cast cost one less to cast for each target and spells your opponent's cast cost one more to cast for each target. So it is a very funky little like hate creature. I wouldn't say hate bear because it's a 4-4 four, four flying and trample, which is a pretty good base stat line. It's a it's a creature that taxes your opponent and also makes your own stuff cheaper. The making things cheaper is actually not super relevant in this environment because I've trended towards extremely cheap, efficient spells because I want you to be able to cast multiple combat tricks in one turn and do fun stuff with combining them. So there's actually, I would say probably half the combat tricks have no colorless costs in them. So you're not going to get a ton of discounts here from Hinata, but that protection ability is going to dramatically change the like fun stack interactions you end up having in this environment where it's like you do get this environment is designed to have the disfigure combat trick war be a core feature and this changes the math on that in a way that is very compelling and interesting to me got to mention iron apprentice briefly because i do have a modular theme and iron apprentice is essentially arcbound worker it's one generic mana for a zero zero enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it it's an artifact creature construct when it dies, if it had counters on it, you put those counters on target creature you control. I deigned, Anthony, I, I deigned to suggest on Twitter that maybe <laughs> this was strictly better than Arcbound Worker because it can put the counters on any creature. It doesn't have to be an artifact creature. And it can put any counter on there. So if you end up with a menace counter or a flying counter on it, you can move that, those counters as well. But it doesn't how'd actually... How'd that, how'd that go for you? Well, I, I, it doesn't actually have the modular ability. And the problem is that the modular deck in like modern that plays Arcbound Worker also plays Zabaz, that other Arcbound creature that cares about other Arcbound triggers. And so this is worse than that in that specific deck because of Zabaz. Zabaz is in this cube. It's complicated. It's very complicated. Zabaz is in this cube. So is Arcbound Worker. And now so is Iron Apprentice because I think that's going to work out quite well. The last one I want to mention, just because it's a card we haven't talked about and I think is kind of cool in this environment, is Colossal Sky Turtle. This card is very exciting to me. Honestly, I thought maybe it would have been on your regular cube list, possibly. It's a little splashy for the regular cube, but I thought maybe you might get there. This is four green, green, blue, seven total mana for a six, five enchantment creature turtle. It's got flying and ward two. So just a big beefy flyer to close out games with a little bit of protection, but it has two separate channel abilities. For two and a green, you can channel it to return target card from your graveyard to your hand. So like a regrowth, and you can channel it for one and a blue to return target creature to its owner's hand. So we've got little overcosted regrowth, little overcosted unsummon, both stapled to a big turtle. This draw my attention because bounce spells are very exciting and good in the combat trick cube and the ki a Makes kind sense. of interaction I have leaned into over just hard removal. Just letting people bounce stuff, slide you back a little bit. It makes it risky to go into combat, but it's not as huge of a setback as losing maybe one of your only creatures you could actually point combat tricks at. So I have a lot of bounce in there and that's maybe appealing because of the bounce. And also I kind of like the idea of sneaking a seven mana card <laughs> into the combat trick cube, which is otherwise extremely low curving. So... That jumps out to me as a very cool card that I'm glad that cube designers have in their design quivers for future cube projects because it does a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, the thing that makes it not really to my taste is that it does have this sort of like menu style design where it's like, hey, here are three disconnected not effects. not particularly resonant. Pick the one that you like and that's relevant now. That, that makes it powerful. That makes it flexible. That makes it effective. But does it make it exciting to me? Not so much. Yeah, it's kind of just a split card stapled to a turtle. <laughs> split turtle. Split turtle turtle i think you got one more environment for us right anthony 
So there are two cards that I'm super excited for for my battle box, which is one of the the projects that I'm happiest with right now of all these mini cube and cube adjacent projects. And here we're going even lower power level than the regular cube. We are going down to like retail limited kinds of board states minus the rares and mythics, basically. Right. So and, and battle battle box is a set of cards that are including all five colors. Both players are playing from the same deck and can play a set of lands from a set of lands that's outside the game. So. Cards Speaking of be... resonant language, I feel like Battlebox could have a better name where it would just kind of express with the name that, that you just great. kind of put it down and start playing, you know? And also, this is one of those things where some people maintain a Battlebox is something totally different. That is true, yeah. And who's to say they are wrong? I mean, everyone's got we different... Could, we could stick with Danger Room. I don't like that one. Yeah, that's not, a, that's not <laughs> No great. offense, that's not very resonant. Brian DeMars. I mean, it's a good, it's a cool name, but it does, I it's don't, not a descriptive. It's not my favorite okay. name. Okay, so the, the, the point is that in this environment, there are very specific demands for the kinds of cards that make sense. They are generally going to need to function in a lot of different situations. Pretty because you're generically just good. You're not going to like, be building yeah. around stuff. and Right. That's the thing. Is It's not like, oh, I we can put a lot of different effects and say, let's put all the aggro cards into one deck and the good control cards into another deck. And so these make sense in the same environment. All the cards are getting mixed together and being played at once. I would also say, arguably, in Battlebox, the power curve is much more important to be conscious of because True. in draft it is somewhat self-selecting you can have some power outliers in draft and people will presumably take them highly and then they have their draft picks to thank for their wins in battle box if you just draw more powerful cards than your opponent then you just kind of look over at the battle box designer and say like what, what's that? up with this why'd you put that card in there why'd you put stir the sands in here you dummy i liked for a while there where uh you were you had your battle box this is your old battle box and you would occasionally just like take a card out of your like EDH deck or something and stick it in there as a special guest. I didn't actually do that, but I did like to joke about <laughs> special guest to the Locust God. Yep. S- special guest, Jace the Mind Sculptor. <laughs> special guest, a Worm Coil Engine. <laughs> Yikes, that would be very good. All right, so we've given more context than we're actually going to talk about cards here. That's fine. The card that I'm most excited for is, again, Moon Circuit Hacker, the same ninja we talked about earlier. For that tracks. many of the same reasons, but it has an additional value in the context of this battle box where looting is really important because you're you're dealing with a lot of different kinds of effects and some things are still somewhat narrow just being able to try and sculpt your hand and get different cards to make more sense is super potent yeah we've both really liked looting in battle box because you have no control over your draws you're just drawing randomly off the top of the deck this allows you to have a little more semblance of a plan where it's like right if i'm being down my opponent currently and i think that i'm the aggro player i might discard a perfectly good seven mana card that i just don't want to draw now i know your new battle box doesn't have seven mana cards in it it's not the best example but it allows you to actually play with some kind of plan instead of just being entirely stuck with the cards you draw yeah so i think this is a instant slam dunk and it's going to play out great the other card i'm maybe equally excited maybe even more excited about is grave lighter this is two and a black for a two two spirit with flying when grave lighter enters the battlefield draw a card if a creature died this turn otherwise each player sacrifices a creature so i love these kinds of effects that sort of encourage you to make maybe unique decisions in combat and not just say like, well, I can attack here, I can't, but maybe you're intentionally attacking because you want to draw that card. I also love cards like Fleshbag Marauder in Battle Box because similarly, they allow you to sort of have interesting decisions in terms of how you're sequencing your creatures and what kinds of creatures you want to keep around, things like that. So I think Gravelighter just offers so many interesting decision points about are you using this to try and force your opponent to sacrifice creatures or are you using it to try and set up uh, generating some card advantage? And all that together, it's also a 2-2 flyer, which is extremely relevant in this context uh, of sort of just the size of creatures that are in this battle box. So I think that if anything, this might be one of the more powerful cards that are going to go in the list, but I think it's a, a perfect fit. That basically concludes our, we're up to six different environments we're talking about in this podcast episode now it's it's getting it's getting a little out of hand i i'm not going to mention the uh the jeskai control battle box though i will say did well okay i'm gonna mention it briefly i did a pass of the cards and there was nothing that jumped out of me i don't think anything is a slam dunk in it the one card i do want to talk about just because i want an excuse to talk about this card briefly that we didn't talk about otherwise and i don't think it's gonna rank highly enough to make the top 20 or whatever we end up talking about on the community set review is discover the impossible it's two and a blue for an instant Look at the top five cards of your library, exile one of them face down, and put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. You may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost if it's an instant spell with mana value two or less. If you don't, put that card into your hand. Kind of a mouthful, but basically what we're getting here is kind of like a, almost like a Supreme Will style ability. Supreme Will is that three mana modal like mana leak versus impulse uh, at instant speed. And this is 
essentially allowing you to draw the top of your five cards of your library at instant speed as a baseline. So worst case scenario, you pay three mana, get the top of the top five cards of your library. Not terrible. The upside here, I think, is actually pretty high. If you end up casting a two mana spell, if you do find a mana leak, if you do find something that is worth two mana in your own environment, then you essentially got the impulse effect a little better than Impulse, right? Impulse is top four. You essentially got like a very good card draw effect at instant speed for one mana in terms of the overall mana spent, right? You paid one additional mana to get that effect. It also makes the actual casting of that spell easier if it's multiple colors. You know, you can discover the impossible into a lightning helix, even if you don't have exactly just Kai mana. I think this card's very cool. I think the art is very cool. I like this card a lot. It is not the kind of card I'm going to be putting in the Bun Magic Cube. It might be the kind of card I end up putting in the... Jeskai Control Battle Box. And overall, I think it's just a very cool inclusion for people that are looking for spell mattery kind of effects or looking to cast a lot of spells. That's the other thing. It is two cast spells for one card, which is kind of nice. They're looking for these kinds of effects at power levels where it's appropriate. Yeah, it's definitely going to be extremely context dependent. In some cases, if you have a lot of spells, if you have things that are going to be uh, paying you off for casting the spell, it's going to make a lot of sense. And I think it's going to be a very fun spell to cast, you know, there's that little bit of mystery. And when it works, it's going to feel great because you're like always double spelling, which is one of the most fun things to do in magic, right? And when Um, it doesn't, it's fine. When it doesn't, the floor is not that bad. I I think, I mean, realistically, I think that in an environment where you're playing this, you're mostly going to hit and you're only going to cast it if you're going to expect to whiff. When it's like your opponent's end step, they did nothing. Now you're just going to cast this to draw a card, right? Which is a perfectly fine mode. Sure. So the card's cool. And as I've taught myself through it just now, I probably am going to add it to the Jets Control okay. Battle okay. Box. Because, you know, there it's like... I, my first thought was like a lot of times, like you want control over what you're casting. And so like being forced to cast that spell right then. But you can just always just draw it. And so like the three mana, draw one of the top five cards of your library is the perfectly fine floor in that environment. So I think I'm going to jam it in there. Because it's that's, that's got that fun kind of variance I like in a battle box. Is that it, Anthony? Have we done the thing? Yeah, I think we've gone far enough down the long tail of cube projects. All right. So as I mentioned, go check out luckypaper.co and fill out these surveys for Neon Dynasty and Neon Dynasty Commander. I, I know most of you are probably not testing cards from that set, or if you are, you're only testing one or two, but just take your time and fill it out. It takes two seconds. We even have it set up. So if you fill out one survey and then click the complete another survey button on that page. It will pre-fill all the information like your cube link and your name and stuff so you don't type that all again. And Anthony, again, has built a beautiful feature on this survey where if you've already made the updates to your cube in Cube Cobra, you just paste that link and it will automatically pull all the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty cards and Neon Dynasty Commander cards and put them in the survey results for you. So all you have to do is rate them and hit submit. We make it easy, people. I'm hoping to get as many responses as we can. We are also always accepting voice memo hot takes on Neon Dynasty and Neon Dynasty Commander. We've already received one before even asking for them. So thank you to that person. If anybody else wants to have your voice on our community review episode, we like having the voices of other people on that episode to really emphasize. And, you know, it's like you described, Anthony, where you like it when a card's mechanical abilities reflect, you know, the card's design. It's like embodied in the actual mechanics. This is an episode where we're talking about the opinions of everyone else that is not us. And I think the actual aesthetic manifestation of that episode containing other voices is a great benefit. So if you got to take, whether it's hot or not, uh, just send it into us. Record a little voice memo on your phone and send that to mail at luckypaper.co or hit me up on uh, Twitter, luckypapermtg, or on the various Discord servers where I can be found under Andy Mangold. That's it. We're done. It wasn't that long. It was kind of long, but it wasn't super duper long. All of... Our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All of the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This podcast is produced by talking about magic cards in Anthony's basement before we go to pre-release tonight to open these cards ourselves. What do you most want to open, Anthony? I'm just excited to look at my beautiful basic lands. I don't don't care what I open. The new ones or the ones you have in your draft pack The ones in my draft pack. Oh, but the new ones are so good, The new ones are extremely good. I'm excited. That's what I'm most excited about for the Turbo Cube, actually, is expanding expanding the wild basic land piles. Yeah. That is one of my favorite parts of the Turbo Cube is your wild basic plans. Very it's inspiring. A good feature. Really committed to the business. Commitment is important. I agree.